Would you take God's Word today and would you open, please, to 1 John in the New Testament, the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 1 to 13. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word today? 1 John 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begot, loveth him also that is begotten of him. And by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. And this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath a witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you might believe on the name of the Son of God. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Pray with me. Father, thank you for this awesome passage of Scripture. Lord, give us understanding. May we apply this truth to our life. And help me, your servant, Lord, to make it clear, and I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Some of you, I think, know by now that uh, after church Sunday morning last week, I received a terrible phone call um, from my brother Jeff that told me that our nephew Jacob um, had passed away. And my brother Jay found him last Sunday morning. He was 28 years old. And, uh, of course, that was just... Uh, parents' worst nightmare, right? And uh, but of course, I went out there and we was with Jay, and this has been one of those hard weeks for a family. And uh, we thank God for the grace of God that brings us through times like this, don't we? The Lord in His grace brings us through. We had His funeral service yesterday. It was a beautiful service. I had the privilege of preaching that service. And the one comfort that I have that gives me great peace is that Jacob was a believer. He did know Jesus as his Savior. And uh, I know that for sure. And the reason I know that is because Jacob would call me many times um, just asking me about the assurance of his salvation. He would always call me. He had some thing he was reading about, some theological question that he wanted an answer to. And quite frankly, sometimes he would call me so much it was kind of irritating, <laughs> you know. I'd say, I don't know if I want to talk this long today to you, Jacob, you know, and, and, uh, but I, I'm grateful for the grace of God in his life that he knew that he was a Christian. He knew that he was saved. I think this is one of the crucial issues that every believer will face, and that is the issue of assurance, getting that assurance of salvation. That's what's on my heart today. That's what I want to preach about. I think because many people seem to struggle with this issue of assurance of salvation, to know with no doubt, absolute certainty, that when you die, you know that you're going to go to heaven. This is, this is the blessing of being in Christ. It's having that absolute settled assurance. That's why Fanny Crosby wrote the song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. It's a great blessing when we have that settled assurance in our heart that we know that we are saved. Do you have that? Do you know for sure? Do you have that unshakable knowledge that you belong to Christ, that your sins are forgiven? 
I, in my ministry and pastoring, I have found that uh, a lot of people wrestle with this. I, I actually think they're people in different classifications. It's possible to be saved and not have assurance. I think that there are people that wrestle with it that are genuinely Christians, and they don't ever really seem to get that clear assurance in their heart. They kind of, like Adrian Rogers used to say, they are bent over like a question mark when they should be standing upright like an exclamation point. God wants us to have that kind of assurance. Spurgeon said this, full assurance is not essential to salvation, but it's essential to satisfaction and to be at peace with yourself. Now, why do people lack assurance? Let me give you some reasons why I think some people lack assurance of their salvation. First of all, strong preaching on God's holy standard. A pulpit that is strong in its preaching, that confronts people's sin, that holds high the standard of holiness, that may cause some people to lack their assurance of salvation. And by the way, it's not a bad thing to have a pulpit that preaches strong because the preaching of the Word is supposed to create anxious hearts. It's supposed to make you examine your heart to make sure that you're in the faith. The apostles all the time in the New Testament called upon the church to examine themselves to make sure that they were in the faith. Peter said, give all diligence to make your calling and your election. Sure, we just had the Lord's Supper. And one of the things we do there is to examine our heart and spiritual examination to make sure that we're in Christ. But another reason is, is because they can't seem to accept forgiveness. They're tyrannized by their emotions. They, they feel like, you know, they're such a sinner that they can't be forgiven. And normally a person who thinks like this, they're fixed on the holiness of God and the wrath of God and God's justice, and they don't really see the mercy of God. And so they have this unbalanced view of God. Now, rest assured, God is a God of holiness. He's a God of wrath. He's a God of justice. But also, friend, know he's also a God of mercy. And he is a God who enjoys and delights in forgiving sins to those who are truly repentant that come to him. Martin Luther used to say, when I look at myself, I can't see how that I'm saved. But when I look at the cross, I can't see how that I'm lost. And that is so very true. When we look at the cross and we see that what Christ has done for us and that his death was sufficient to pay our sin debt, that's where our peace comes from. But another reason why people fail to have assurances, they fail to comprehend the gospel and the plan of salvation. They fail to comprehend, again, the full sufficiency of Christ's death, that the death of Christ on the cross fully satisfied all of God the Father's demands for sin to be paid for. God's wrath fell on Christ. And the proof that God was satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ was the fact that Jesus came out of that grave. He resurrected. That was God the Father's approval of the sacrifice of Christ. And so when you feel like uh, you can't comprehend that, then again, focus on the cross and God's, the Father's satisfaction of what Jesus did on the cross. And then another reason why some people may doubt their assurance is because they don't know the exact time of their salvation. Sometimes people come to me and say, I don't remember the exact moment I believe. I don't remember the exact day, time, or place. And because they don't remember the exact moment, the exact day or hour, they doubt their salvation. It's kind of like saying, I can't remember my birthday, and if I can't remember my birthday, I'm not sure I'm alive. Look, what's important is, you, that, is that you are alive, not that you can't remember the exact day. And this is what we've done in the church. We've kind of made a fetish out of decisionism, and we try to isolate this. You know, if you can't remember the exact moment, date, time, and place, then, you know, you must not be saved. And, beloved, that's just, I don't see that in Scripture anywhere. I can't tell you the exact hour or moment or day that I trusted Jesus. I just know this. I'm, I believe on him right now with all my heart. It's not, did you believe past? It's, are you believing presently? Are you standing in Christ right now? You see, that's the most important issue. And even Jesus said this. Jesus said in, in John 3, he said, you know, the wind blows wherever it wants to, and you can tell when it comes or wh whether it goes. But, and so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. In other words, uh, you never know when the wind is going to come or when it's going to go. The wind is sovereign. And there's a sense in which God's work in salvation is like that. 
He may come upon you and he may bring regeneration to your heart. We might not know the exact moment when that happened. But what's important is we believe. And that belief is not, again, it's not aorist. It is present indicative. It is continually believing. A true believer is not someone that believed at one moment and then they don't believe anymore. A true believer continually believes. A true believer continually repents. We repented when we got saved, and we live in continual repentance because we have turned away from the world, and now we're walking towards Christ. You see, that's the idea. And some people doubt their salvation because they still feel the flesh so strongly, and they wonder if they have a new nature. But you must remember that you are a new creation and you are still incarcerated in unredeemed flesh. And we're waiting for the redemption of the body. We're, we're waiting for our full salvation. It's not there yet. We are justified and we are being sanctified, but the full measure of our salvation has not yet been fully revealed until we are glorified when Jesus comes back. And st- until that time, we still live in this body of flesh, and we still struggle with the sin nature. And that's why the Bible says we groan. We strive with our sins. We wrestle against our sins. There is the struggle that we continually have. It's, it, the, you know, I, I said this yesterday. The people that uh, concern me are not people that wrestle with their flesh and struggle with sin. That's a sign of life to me. The very fact that the struggle is there reveals their spiritual life. What bothers me is people who never struggle. There's no struggle at all. There's no uh, trying to perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. There's no striving against sin in their life. They seem to have had this idea that, you know, they're okay, and whatever they do is okay, and however they live is okay. But no, if you are a true believer, you will continually have warfare in your soul, warfare against the flesh and sin and its fallenness. And another reason why people doubt their salvation is because they don't see God's hand in their trials. When something bad happens, they say something like this, how could God love me? How could God let me go through this? I must not be saved for God to allow me to go through what I went through. How could God take my loved one? How could God not hear my prayer? How could all this happen? I Surely I must not be saved. And friend, if you think like that, you sentence yourself to a lack of assurance And really what you're doing is you're missing a source of assurance. Because let me tell you one of the great sources of assurance. One of the strongest evidences of true salvation is that you go through a trial and you don't lose faith. When that happens, you know what that reveals? That your faith was real. That it was genuine. In fact, one of the reasons God allows us to go through trials is so that we can have a strong assurance that when the trial is over, we still have faith. That gives us that inward knowledge that we really belong to the Lord. Remember what Job said, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. God is doing that work of strengthening our faith. Romans says, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces what? It produces endurance. And that endurance produces character. And that character produces hope. And our hope does not put us to shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. All the trials and the heartaches and the sufferings we go to translates into assurance that we have the love of God that has been shed abroad in our hearts. And so trials are a means to give us that full assurance. And so it's very possible for someone to be saved and not have that assurance. It's possible to have assurance and not be saved. These are the people I really worry about. This is the most dangerous position to be in. There are some people who have assurance who have no right to it. One time a lady came to D.L. Moody. She said, Mr. Moody, I've been saved for 25 years, and I've never doubted it. And D.L. Moody said, ma'am, I doubt you're saved. You've never doubted it. You've never wrestled. There's been no striving in your heart. It's a false assurance that many people have because they're depending on other things. For example, there are people that say, oh, I remember the daytime and the place when I prayed a prayer, but since that time, there's been no obedience in their life. There's been no striving against sin. 
There's been no real desire to obey the Lord Jesus, which is a telltale sign of a true believer. You're just going to want to do whatever Jesus says. You might not understand what everything he says when you first get saved, but you know this, you're going to want to do what he says. But there's none of that. These are the people I go out, I knock on their door, I tell them, hey, I'm, I'm visiting from Grace Bible Baptist, I share the gospel. They, they say, oh, you don't have to worry about me, preacher. I'm fine. I remember 30 years ago when I prayed and asked Jesus to save me. And really? Well, what church do you go to? Oh, I haven't ever been back to church. They are living in continual disobedience, and yet they have a full assurance. It's like the song says, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Jesus said this, one of the most fearful verses in the Bible, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom. And so this is why it's so important that we examine ourselves to make sure that we are in the faith. And then thirdly, it's possible to be saved and have absolute full assurance. And this is where God wants us. He wants us to know this. He wants us to have absolute assurance. Now, there are some, surprisingly, that teach that this is not available in this life. I've read some books from scholars, and I I find myself shaking my head sometimes because there are some who actually teach that, um, you know, this, this full assurance is not really possible. There's no way for you to know. And I wonder if they ever read 1 John 5.13. Look at the verse again. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye might, what? He wants you to know. That ye might know that you have eternal life. Write down Isaiah 32, 17, and the work of righteousness shall shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness is quietness and assurance forever. Wherever God imputes his righteousness, he brings with it a quietness. He brings with it a peace and an assurance so that you can know, you can have that absolute certainty that you are a child of God. So let me just give you just three what I call infallible proofs of, of assurance. And I, I find these here in 1 John 5. We'll, we'll go through it rather quickly here. You could spend weeks on this, but here's the first one. I call this the external evidence of the saint. These are objective evidences we have to use the Scripture to, com, to examine our life with. The first one is saving faith. Look again in 1 John 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. Look at the word believe there. That's not talking about just an intellectual knowledge or a mental assent. The Greek word believe is referring to a wholehearted acceptance of everything that is implied in the claims of Christ. Some have taught that in order to be saved, all one has to do is just make some kind of intellectual acknowledgement about Jesus. Some have taught this. In fact, two men taught that a person who believed that Jesus is Lord had saving faith. That's all you had to do is just believe Jesus is Lord and just say that. I believe he's Lord. But there's more to it than that. The word believe here has, requires more. Um, there has to be repentance. There has to be submission to the lordship of Christ. And saving faith involves all of these elements. We have to believe in our mind that Jesus was the Savior, the Son of God, who came and died for our sins. We have to believe with all our heart, but there has to be a commitment of our will to that. Have you committed your life? Have you submitted yourself to Jesus Christ as your Savior? Systematic theology recognizes all these elements of true salvation. Remember, James taught about this. James says, look, faith without works is dead. And then he also said the devils believe and they tremble. You know, demons believe who Jesus is. They believe he was the Savior. They believe he was the Holy One. They believe he dies and rose again. But demons aren't getting saved. They they tremble. They have an emotional response. And it's okay to believe in your heart and believe in your mind, but it has to go beyond that. We have people sometimes that come to church and they cry crocodile tears over who Jesus is, and then they go out and live in sin. That's not true salvation. There has to be a commitment of the will. Dynamic faith involves the mind, 
and the heart and the will. It's a commitment of the whole person to Jesus Christ. And so there has to be saving faith. But then secondly, there's our sweet fellowship. Look again in verse number uh, 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. In other words, another external evidence that John mentions is love for other believers. If you're saved, you're going to love the fellowship of the saints of God. You're going to love church. You're going to love being around other believers. I remember when I first got saved, I just, I just love being in church. I love being around God's people. I, when you meet another Christian and you know that they're a Christian, there's just something about it where your heart immediately unites with that person. It doesn't matter where they're from or who they are. I've been all over the world, and I've met Christians, and immediately there's this common bond that takes place and love between people because we are in Christ together. And you're going to love the fellowship of God's people. You're going to want to be in the fellowship with God's people. Sometimes I hear people say, I love Jesus, I just don't love the church. Well, the Bible says the church is the bride of Christ. You, you, are you saying you love Jesus, you don't just love his bride? You're going to insult Jesus' bride? I wouldn't want to be in that position. You're going to love the people. Look, just take a little trip with me. Look in 1 John chapter 2. Look down at verse number 9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. You claim to be a Christian and you actually hate someone else who claims to be no Christ, you're not saved. John says, you're still in darkness if you claim to hate your brother. Look at verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. Look in chapter 3. Look down at verse number 14. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Look at verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life. Why? Because we, what, love the brethren. This is how I know that my salvation is real. I love God's people. I love the brethren. Look at chapter 4. Look down at verse number 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Verse 8, he that loveth not, what? Knoweth not God. You don't love your brother. You don't know God, John says. So there is just our sweet fellowship. But then there's another one. Look in, uh, go back to chapter 5, look down at verse number 2. And by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So there's kind of a logical progression. You'll have saving faith, and that saving faith will be manifested because you will love the people of God. And when you love the people of God, you're going to want to keep God's commandments. And the word keep here is just the idea of obeying the commandments of Christ. Now, he's not talking here about the Ten Commandments. It's talking about the commandments that Jesus gives us. Look in, go back to chapter 2, 1 John, and look down in verse number 3. 1 John 2, 3. And hereby we do know that we know him. You want to know that you know Jesus? You want to know that you're really saved? Here's how you know. If we keep his what? Commandments. This is how you know if you keep his commandments. Now, again, the word for commandment here is not Torah. It's, it's entole. His commandments, that's the commandments of Christ. Again, this is not talking about obeying the Ten Commandments. This is talking about just doing what Jesus says, just obeying whatever Jesus tells you to do. And look at verse 4. He that says, I know him, I'm saved, and keepeth not his commandments is a what? Liar. And the truth is not in him. That's not me, that's John. John says, you tell me that you know him and you're not keeping his commandments, you're not obeying Jesus, you're a liar. John's pretty clear. He's very black or white, no gray area. If you know him, you're going to keep his commandments. And by the way, when it says keep his commandments, it doesn't mean that you're perfect in your obedience. And what it means is you just simply have a desire to obey Jesus. Does that mean we do it perfectly? No. There's going to be times when we don't obey him the way we should. There's going to be times when we fail and we fall, but my overwhelming desire is to obey Jesus, even though I may fall, 
even though I may fail. It's like Peter said after he denied the Lord, Lord, you know all things. You know my heart. You know I love you. You know I want to do what you want me to do. Even though I fail at times, there's that inward desire to obey Jesus. And John says, this is how you know that you know him. And it's interesting to play on words here in the Greek. This is how we, um, present indicative actor, this is how we continually know that we, perfect tense, have already come to know him. This is how we have continual assurance and knowledge that we've already come to know Jesus as our Savior. It's our obedience. So there will be this simple fruit in our life that we will obey Christ. And then there's what I call our spiritual freedom. Look again in chapter 5. Look down in verse number 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. What's he saying here? This is another external evidence that you're a believer, and that is you overcome the world. Overcome, we see this word twice. I think it's one of John's favorite words. It's, where we, it's the word Nikea, where we get the word Nike. Um, to overcome, to have victory. This was the Greek god of victory. This is how we know that we're saved. God gives us the ability to overcome the world and its fallenness. Whereas before we were saved, the world was constantly pulling us in. We were going the same way as the world. The world had its way with us. But once we get saved, we overcome the world. The world no longer has the pull that it had before. The things of the world are no longer alluring to a child of God. We overcome the world and its fallenness, the world and its system. At times, can a believer be worldly at times? Yeah, at times. But that's not the overall pattern of life for a true believer. A true believer is someone who has learned to overcome the world through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know why? Because a true believer sees where this world is headed. And I want to tell you something, friend, it's on the way down. There's nothing out there for us in this world. And a true believer has the faith to see that, that the only real value of real life is in the kingdom of God. It's not in this world. It's in the kingdom. And that's why we're able to overcome the world and we overcome the fallenness of this world. And John again says in chapter 2, verse 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This world is passing away, John says in verse 17. And the lust thereof, it's all passing away. It's all temporary. But he who does the will of God abides forever. And so we have the freedom, the spiritual freedom to overcome the world and its fallenness. And now these are all external evidences. And what you have to do as a believer is you have to look at your life and you have to say, are these things true of me? Do I have real saving faith? Do I really love the people of God? Do I love the church? Do I really want to obey Jesus? Do I just want to do what he says in my life? I may not do it perfectly, but my heart's desire is to obey him. Have I overcome the fallenness of the world or does the world still have its claws in me, constantly pulling me in? And I'm allured by it. You'll overcome the world. But then here's the second major idea here. Not only the external evidence, but what I call the eternal evidence of the Son. Look in verse number 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. One reason people lack assurance is because we don't have a strong theological foundation about Christ. And I think Christ is under attack. Even in supposed evangelical or fundamental churches, it just amazes me how people don't have a strong theology about who Jesus is. And that is so foundational. It is so fundamental. And back in John's day, they were attacking the deity of Christ. They were attacking the incarnation of Christ. They were claiming that um, Jesus uh, was not who he says he was. And John, like a lawyer, calls in witnesses to testify as to who Jesus is. Notice the witnesses that he calls. Look at verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. 
The first witness that he calls is water. You say, how does that work? You know, a lot of times, you know, I read where commentators look at this and they look at the, the, the word water and blood. They don't know how to treat this. And they try to say, well, this is talking about the, when the spear went into the side of Jesus on the cross, out came blood and water, and they try to somehow you know, met, you know, mix that together. That has nothing to do with what John's saying here, nothing to do with it. You know what John's doing here? And by the way, some say, well, the water means baptism, the blood means Lord's Supper, and they try to bring that in. And again, that, that just confuses the matter. What John is doing is he's bringing in witnesses to testify that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He is the Son of God. And what's the first witness? Well, there's the testimony of his baptism. And John uses one word to speak about a whole event that took place. Everything that took place at the baptism of Christ is a witness as to who Jesus is. We do this all the time, right? Where we just mention a part of something to represent the whole. Don't we do that in English? You ever say, you know, I'm trying to keep bread on the table. What does bread stand for? It stands for all of the groceries. Do you eat just bread? No, it stands for everything. I'm trying to keep a roof over my head. Is that all you want is a roof? Or does the roof talk about the whole house? And this is what John is doing here. John is saying, this is he that came by water. What water, John? The water of Jesus' baptism. Do you remember what happened at the baptism of Christ? where the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and there was a voice that said, this is my son. That's strong evidence as to who Jesus is. John calls in the evidence of water, and then blood. What do you think blood stands for? The cross, right? Were there miracles and things that took place at the cross that proved that Jesus was the son of God? Absolutely. So much so that a hardened Roman centurion standing at the foot of the cross said what? Truly this was the Son of God. Truly this was the Son of God. What happened? Well, the sun was darkened at noonday. There was an earthquake. The temple veil rent in twain from top to bottom. All these things that took place were testimony that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And then there's another witness. Look in verse number 6 at the end. And it is the Spirit that bears witness because the Spirit is truth. And so you have the testimony of the Holy Spirit who is constantly bearing witness as to who Jesus is. And here's the bottom line. If you don't have your Christology right, you're not going to be saved. If you don't believe that Jesus was the virgin-born, sinless Son of God who died and rose again and that the right hand of God the Father is coming back someday, if you don't believe everything he said about himself, there's no possibility for you to be a Christian. Salvation is about Christ. It's about who he is and what he did. So you have to believe that, that eternal evidence of Jesus Christ. But let me just give you one more There's the external evidence of the saint. There is the eternal evidence of the son. Number three, there's what I call the internal evidence of the spirit. This is where assurance gets to be subjective. All these other things are objective. They're on the outside, and we have to measure ourselves objectively to these evidences. But there's also an inward witness, subjective, and that's the Holy Spirit. And really, the, the question is, have you experience in your life the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You say, how do I know that I'm saved? Well, the Holy Spirit, you'll experience his ministry in your life. Look in 1 John 4, look at verse number 13. Notice what it says. And hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he has given us of what? His Spirit. That's how you know you've been given the Holy Spirit. And this Spirit is an internal subjective testimony to your own heart that you are a child of God, that you belong to him. You know, in a court of law, sometimes a case will hinge on the testimony of one person who is called a key witness. Here, John is saying, your key witness is the Holy Spirit. Look in verse number uh, 9. Actually, in verse 8, there are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood, these three agree in one. And if we receive 
the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. The Holy Spirit will bear witness in your heart, and he will testify, first of all, to the world, but then he'll testify to you as well. Look in verse number 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. If you believe on Jesus, then you have an internal witness that is constantly telling you that you are a child of God. You have that inward Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit in you. And John's logic is simple. Look, you receive the witness of men all the time. Don't you believe what people tell you normally? I mean, it's getting harder. But normally we believe what people tell us. You receive the witness of men. Well, if you'll do that, why don't you receive a greater witness? God doesn't lie. The Holy Spirit doesn't lie. And he will bear witness with your heart. Romans 8, where it says, you have not received the spirit of bondage to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. When the Holy Spirit enters into you, he gives you that sense that you are in the family of God. You have been adopted into the family of God. So much so that there's something inside of you that wants to cry out what? Heavenly Father, Father, there's that intimacy that you have because you receive that inward witness. And what what else the Holy Spirit does is he brings to us the word of God. He constantly is pointing us to the record. Go to the scripture. Look at what the scripture says and believe what the word of God says. Look at verse 11. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. God will constantly through the Holy Spirit, points you back to the Word of God and what Scripture says and the sufficiency of what Christ did on the cross for you. He'll point you back to that and say, trust in that. Believe in that. God cannot lie. Don't reject the witness of the Spirit when the Holy Spirit witnesses in your heart about who Jesus is. And so that's That's just John there telling us, and again in verse 13, and these things have I written on you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you might know that you have eternal life. Now, let me tell you my greatest desire. I'm kind of out of time here. But my greatest desire as a father and as a pastor, my greatest desire is that all of my children know Jesus that they know that they're going to heaven. I know you parents all agree. My children, my grandchildren, my brothers, their family members. It's like I said yesterday, I want all my family and friends on board the ark because this world is in trouble. There's a flood of judgment coming, beloved. I want them all on board the ark. But I also want to say that every person under my ministry, that under my preaching, I want them to know that they know Christ. I want them to have that absolute certainty, not a false assurance, but an absolute assurance that you know Jesus Christ, that you know that you're going to heaven. And I pray, beloved, that this, you'll, you'll treat this, this is the most important issue, the most important issue of your life, that you know him. And I pray that you'll Examine your heart according to the Scripture and make sure. Let's, let's bow for prayer together. And so, Father, thank you for the clarity of Scripture and how you have given us in your Word a way that we can have absolute certainty that we are in the kingdom, that we're on board the ark, that we know that we are going to heaven. And Father, remind us again how this, this world, the direction it's going, the fallenness of this world, that, Lord, so much so that we would see how vain and empty this world is. And may that in itself 
be a motivation to those who don't know Christ to, to jump on board the ark, to get into the kingdom of God, to make sure that they know that they're saved, to settle that matter in their own heart and life. And what I want you to do, beloved, is just take a moment. I'm, I'm going to just be quiet here, and I want you, right where you are, to pray. Ask God to give you that blessed assurance in your heart that you're a child of God. Make sure that you know. Do business with God right where you are. Tell Jesus right where you are, Lord Jesus, I trust you now. I'm believing on you now. Not believe past tense, but presently. I believe on you as the Savior and the Lord, the only Savior. And I put my faith in what you did for me at Calvary. And give me that assurance that I'm in Christ. Would you say that? Would you pray? Would you make sure? Again, Father, thank you for your precious word. May it minister to hearts, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.